Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is Call to War 2020 Urgent Briefing Part 2. Now, obviously, if you've been following along with our uh, Call to War briefings, we're up through number 14, and there is definitely more of those to come in that flow and direction. But Saturday morning early, the Lord spoke to me a, a very clear word for the church. And he gave me three parts to it, and I began to write. And I wrote essentially all day Saturday, most all of the day Sunday, and uh, all this morning till I came here to uh, uh, do this video or this message. Uh, and it's such a clear, specific word that I he spoke to me that I was supposed to not just print it and uh, uh, disseminate it as a document, but that I was supposed to, uh, supposed to actually teach it. And this is uh, part two. The uh, entire document is named something like uh, a, uh, a passionate plea, burden, and word from an apostolic elder. And part one is the plea. And this is part two. And the title of this is The Burden of an Apostolic Elder. And uh, I, I'm going to do what I almost never do because these words are so specific and they were given with such a specific flow. I will be reading most of what I wrote on this part two in this briefing. Uh, you will know the difference between when I'm reading and when I'm actually commenting on what I wrote. <clears throat> or what the Lord gave me to write. Um, so this is um, uh, this is very critical. I am so moved in my spirit, and this particular part of the three is especially near and dear to my heart, and I am privileged to be a conduit to be able to speak these things. Others are saying these things, and I thank God, and I thank, I thank God that there are uh, men of God and women of God uh, around this world that God is saying these same, same things to. Uh, but that does not uh, allow me to hide in my corner or my cave and protect myself uh, by not saying them because others are saying them. He has called me to do this, and I'm doing it. And so we will begin. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will allow him to give you eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to perceive what his spirit is saying to the church in this hour. And he is speaking to us. He is speaking to us. He has permitted our whole worlds to be shut down so that we don't have anything to do but think and uh, and uh, pray and study. I know people are using that time for a lot of different things, but that's not the will of God. It's not the will of God. So I'm reading The Burden of an Apostolic Elder. Very likely the most important lesson of this currently imposed time of complen co contemplation. Excuse me, I'm going to start that again. Very likely the most important lesson of this currently imposed time of contemplation and introspection uh, is to bring us to the place that we receive God's adamantly conveyed message that his house, the church, the people, the church are the people, all of us who are his saints, that his house must fully and scripturally become, first and foremost, you ready? A house of prayer. He is determined to make that happen. And those that aren't letting him make that happen in their life or in their local uh, body of believers, he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. When he's trying to get his people to do that, and we don't do that, he takes the my off of that for us. 
We're still his house of prayer, or he still has a house of prayer. We're just no longer a part of that because we disqualify ourselves from being included because we won't give prayer his priority. Biblically, prayer must be the foremost significant daily expression of both our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry through us. It's got to be first in our lives. It's got to be first in our lives over everything, not just the spiritual, but what we would term the secular. It's got to be first. Prayer has got to be number one in our lives. Any ministry that is elevated above prayer in its importance is rendered impotent thereby. So anything, anything we do, any type of ministry we do, that we elevate in importance ahead of prayer, it just became impotent and can do nothing that God recognizes. Scripturally and relatively speaking, it is far more pleasing to God for us to pray an hour and preach five minutes than it is for us to pray five minutes and to preach an hour. In principle, from God's perspective, this is true every time. Uh, well, but I, I have so much to study to get ready to preach. That's our problem. We become sermon writers rather than prayer warriors. And we wonder why supernatural stuff is not happening when we preach. Because God's not bearing witness to our sermons. Because those sermons, the, the, the initial word or direction may have come from God. You may have gotten that from God. But we take it over. And we put all our stuff in there, all our examples and all our illustrations and all our oratory. And we get it all written out perfect and we practice it and then claim we're preaching it. And what happens? Oh, other than stirring people's emotions up, there's nothing eternal that happens because of that. So the people sitting in our congregation are like a piece of paper on a highway when a semi comes along. The turbulence of that semi passing causes that piece of paper to flutter up in the air and it looks like something is happening. Look what that paper's doing. But as soon as that turbulence stops, that paper goes right back to where it was. And it's nothing changed. So we can have all the professional services we want and preach all the professional sermons we want. But the proof of whether or not it's from God is not how people respond. It's how it affects eternity. And if our worship services and our preaching and our prayer meetings don't affect eternity, then they're not biblical. They're not biblical. How we pray, how often we pray, and the why of our prayer more accurately reveals whether or not we have a true biblical relationship with God than any other spiritual exercise, practice, activity, or ministry. Nothing, nothing reveals whether or not we have a relationship with God more than our prayer lives. Nothing. Nothing. Not our outward standards, not our faithfulness to church, not our faithfulness in tithe, not our faithfulness in obeying the pastor, not our faithfulness in, in, in our adamant holding to the doctrine. Nothing says that I owe no God and have a relationship with God like prayer. The importance and priority that we place on prayer of all types reveals our faith or lack of it reveals our humility or lack of it, reveals our spirituality or lack of it, reveals our submission to God and his authority or lack of it, reveals our Bible-based priorities or the lack of them, and reveals our saved condition or the lack of it. I, I know this is, I feel even foolish asking these questions, but God asks these questions. And I understand why he asked the questions. I am 74 years old and have been in this all my life. I understand why he asked the questions, but it's, it's those kind of questions you don't want to have asked you and you don't want to ask. Can individ, any individual that does not pray as we are taught to pray by the word of God, 
actually be saved? Is not prayer the most easily recognized daily evidence of saving faith? Or let's ask it another way. Can I truly have saving faith and not pray as the focus, foundation, and empowerment of my saved life? The very obvious biblical answer to all of these questions is a resounding no. There's no biblical salvation without a true relationship with God. I can be the most faithful religious practitioner in the oneness Pentecostal movement and go to hell if I don't know Jesus. And if I have a biblical relationship with God that pleases him, then I will pray as the most important priority of my day and life. Because true biblical prayer is life. Psalm 1611, David declared, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. That single verse is the most succinct and powerful definition of biblical prayer and its purpose that can be found anywhere. In fact, Peter actually quoted it on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 28. He didn't quote all of it, but the reference is there. I want you to note very carefully in this verse. It is not enough just to fellowship with God's presence in devotional prayer to have life. You are not on the path of life if you only do devotional prayer. You're not. Not biblically. Why? Because we must also become a conduit for his power and authority. In other words, we must participate with his right hand. So in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, when we're a submitted conduit of his power and authority, the right hand, is exercised and operated through us in ministry to this world, that is the path of life. And without those two, I'm not yet really living yet. I'm not. Both elements are absolutely necessary by definition in order to truly and fully participate in biblical prayer. With all that being the case, unfathomably, there are some preachers who preach to people that they do not earnestly pray for daily. That results in them only performing their service sermons for the entertainment of the crowd to impress them and build the crowd around their personalities. There are some people leading us in worship who have no genuine relationship with God, who only use their talents and abilities through their flesh and then only perform so that they can be seen and heard. The idea that any of this is okay with God is preposterous. It's unfathomable that anybody can actually believe that God is okay with that. It is both devastating to the purpose of the gospel and totally dishonors the price that was paid to provide it. When our preaching is performance and our worship and leadership of worship is performance and entertainment to gratify and magnify the flesh. Tragically, when preacher churches are preached to like that and preachers are led in praise like that, it prevents those local churches which are being exercised thereby from experiencing the promised liberty of the Spirit of God. And thus they become spiritually bound at best and completely backslidden at worst. Like the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, they may have doctrinal truth, but their lack of spiritual love for Jesus completely negates any value that their doctrinal truth may have in the Lord's sight. 
He gives no credence to doctrinal truth practiced by people that don't love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the greatest commandment. The Lord Jesus Christ, through the Apostle John, warned the Ephesians of their impending rejection and subsequent ejection from his presence forever if they did not repent. If God threatened the church at Ephesus or warned the church at Ephesus that they were about to be lost forever, is he going to tolerate loveless churches and loveless saints Today, is that okay with him? Pastor, it may be okay with you. Believer, it may be okay with you to go to a church where the love of God is not expressed first and foremost in prayer and second in praise and third in the ministry of the word in some order, but those three, if it's okay to, with you to go sit through all of that when there's no obvious love for God there, and hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. If I've been given the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I'm not able to give myself to the love of God and the flow of the love of God in me, to me, and through me, No. God cannot warn the Ephesians that he's going to remove their candlestick and leave us saved today. Not if God is a just God. Not if God is truly an unchanging God. Hear me when I tell you this by the Holy Ghost. We need to repent of our prayerlessness right now. It is sin. Oh, I can hear it. I know. But we pray. Yeah, well, just hang on. We'll talk about that. We'll pray. We pray. By whose definition of prayer? By whose teaching on what prayer is and isn't? Traditions or the Word of God? Again, our prayers are the most telling expression and manifestation of our personal relationship with God or the lack of it. Having been born in the, and raised in the UPC, I have experienced all the different types, dimensions, and expressions of prayer as we have promoted it all these years. From pray one hour a day to pray the prayer wheel to praying the tabernacle pattern of praying to praying 6 a.m. prayer, to praying spiritual warfare prayer. I've done all of those. I've participated in all of those. They promoted prayer, prayers in the Word of God, so I tried all of that, participated in all of that. And thank God we seem to be progressing. Hopefully one day soon we'll actually arrive at truly biblical prayer by the definition of the Word of God, not our tradition. Yet, for most faithful Pentecostals, prayer is still something we do rather than an atmosphere in which we live. Referencing Galatians 5.24, that we live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, and Romans uh, 1 and 8, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. We don't seem yet to have a full and impacting revelation of the potential and the power of prayer. How many people quote Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us and don't even realize he's talking about prayer. Prayer. All we ask or think, prayer. Not what we speak, what we ask or think, prayer. We don't even have a revelation that that's talking about prayer. We don't even believe prayer. Too many don't even believe that prayer is that powerful. Oh, I can feel the pushback. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who are you to tell me I'm not praying? 
I'm I'm just I'm just a nobody. Okay? I'm just a conduit that's trying to be as neutral to God as I possibly can be so that he can flow through me and say whatever he wants to say, however he wants to say it, without anything that's a part of me contaminating that. That's who I am. I'm just a conduit. But here's the problem you've got. Just like when the Jewish council was upset with the apostles and they wanted to kill them, Gamaliel said, be careful. If this is not of God, it'll come to nothing. But if it is God, be careful you're not found to be fighting against it. So I understand this is hard to hear. I understand it's hard to say. You think it's easy to sit and say to people that the way you prayed all your life might not be good enough to, for God? That it should be a place you're passing through, not a place where you built your palace to live? That's not easy to do. I love this church. I love the brotherhood, brethren. I love the brotherhood. I love the people of God. I've given my life to ministering to the people of God. I'm not called to be an evangelist. God has used me to win souls personally. And I have preached evangelistic when I, when it was the will of God, when I was, uh, uh, my wife and I were establishing this church in Annapolis, Maryland. But that's not my ministry. I have had and do today have primarily a ministry to the body of Christ. That's why if you read the stuff I post online or the, the recordings that I make, I'm ministering to the body of Christ. Why would I do all of that if I don't love the people I'm ministering to? But, but the first commandment is to love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second commandment is like, namely this, my value doesn't come in who I see myself to be. My value comes in who he sees me to be. And what he sees me to be is a conduit for his love to flow through me to somebody else. So my goal is not to love you. That's not the purpose. That's not the plan. My goal is just to be a conduit for him to love you. And let me tell you something about the love of God. You read the Bible, you find how the love of God operates. The love of God tells us what we need to hear, what we should hear, not what we want to hear a lot of the time. That's the love of God. But we can't receive the love of God in our culture today because we have to be bragged on. We don't want anybody telling us the truth. We want them to lie to us and tell us we're okay so we can keep on being what we're being and keep on doing what we're doing. I'm sorry. One day I'm going to have to answer to God for, my, for whether or not I've been faithful to what I've been called to do and be in him. And I'm seeking to please him. I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please him. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to please him to give him an opportunity to say whatever he wants to say in whatever venue and avenue he wants to use to say it. I'm begging you to let him open your ears to hear that the Spirit is speaking to the church. I could be in my recliner at home right now, kicked up reading a book on iPad, watching some stupid YouTube video. Just wiling away my time waiting for the, virus, the crisis to be over like a lot of people are doing. But I'm not. I'm sitting here trying to talk to the hungry that want the real move of God that he's promised. And we're not going to get it by our religion and our traditions and our practices that we, we're trying to make work. We're only going to get it by obeying the word of God. And the first and foremost thing we've got to obey is we've got to become a house of prayer. We've got to become that. I'm going to start again here. For most faithful Pentecostals, and I've been at Pentecost all my life, this is, I know this to be the case. Prayer is still something that we do. It's a task we accomplish rather than an atmosphere in which we live. How in the world can you pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and prayer be something we do rather than an atmosphere in which we live? 
we don't, we, we don't have that revelation. Most still believe that prayer is just a time of petitioning God to fix all the things they don't like about their lives and to ask him to give them what they want. But when you read Matthew chapter 6, just read the whole chapter. And Luke chapter 12, read the whole chapter. But there are Matthew 6, 5 through 34 and Luke 12, 22 through 32. Read that. And you tell me then if prayer is for the purpose of getting God to give us our needs and our wants and to fix what we don't like. Read that and tell me that's what Jesus says. And those are the words of Jesus when he was teaching the disciples to pray. Why is it we don't pray like he taught us to pray? It's in the Bible. We're so really big on obeying all the nuances of salvation doctrine and Godhead doctrine. I believe all of that. I don't know anybody who believes any stronger than I do. But what about the rest of the book? We end up teaching the commandments of God by the traditions of men. We pollute the word of God with our practices that we've always done. And then we emasculate them and make them impotent so they can produce nothing of any eternal spiritual value. God help us. God help us. And these folks that, are, that think that, they, that, that prayer is only need-based, that they struggle to pray if they don't have a need. So when they've got a need, boy, they can pray. Well, let me tell you something. I, I, I've I got good news and bad for you, news for you. God loves you so much that he is determined in this day and time to make sure you've always got a need to pray for. He's got the whole world praying for a need right now, doesn't he? People that haven't prayed or maybe never prayed. He haven't prayed in a long time or maybe never prayed. They're praying now. Some that don't even believe in prayer, they're trying to find out if there's somebody there to pray to. People that haven't thought about God in forever. And even those that have mocked God in their private times, when they're terrorized with the potential of getting sick and dying, they're talking to God. Oh, they may act tough and whatever when they're by themselves, but when the lights are turned off and they're laying there in that bed by themselves trying to go to sleep, and that fear won't leave them alone. And their torment in their minds won't leave them alone. They're sighing and crying. Yesterday morning in prayer, I heard it. Believe, I don't care what you believe about that statement. I'm telling you right now, in the spirit, he let me hear for just a, a short while what he's hearing right now. The sigh, the cry of the fearful. The empty, those that don't know what to do with their life, that don't know where to go, where to go from here. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. He's hearing it. And people don't even know it's considered prayer because they haven't read Psalm 79, 11, let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. Prisoners to what? Prisoners to fear to terror, to their, their mortality and the fact they could die. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee according to the greatness of thy power. Preserve thou those that are appointed to die. Well, we're now the conduit for that. We're supposed to be praying for that. You want to be changed? You want to be changed? You think I'm radical? You ain't seen nothing yet. I can't get sound of those sighing and crying out of my head that I heard in the spirit. He let me hear what he's hearing right now. This world's terrified. And what are we doing? We're fussing and complaining because we can't do what we've always done to have church. Oh, we church, we have church. You have pre-service prayer. And what's the, what's the purpose of that pre-service prayer? The whole focus of it is God bless this service and bring people to church and save somebody in this church and perform miracles in this service. What about the world? We spend all that time praying for the barn and the activities of the barn. We don't pray for the field. God help us. God help us. 
we are such prisoners to the blindness that tr religious tradition brings to us that nullifies and against the word of God. I hate religious tradition. Anybody's. Sadly, so much of the way so many have learned to pray is not even remotely close to God's true purpose of prayer for prayer. This can be easily discovered in an honest, objective, diligent search of the scriptures on this subject. But I warn you, if you study what the Bible says about prayer and you do it diligently and you do it comprehensively, it's really dangerous to your traditions because it's going to undermine most of what we think we know about prayer. How do I know that? I've got hundreds and hundreds of pages of study notes on the subject because I'm not interested in what man, some man says about prayer. I wonder what God says about prayer. So I see what the Bible says about prayer, and then there's only one way to learn to pray. You pray until you can pray. You pray until you die to yourself and the Spirit of God begins to teach you how to pray. And this hour of prayer stuff, it might have been good for people who weren't praying at all, but you are never going to learn how to pray, pray in just an hour a day. It doesn't all have to be at one moment, but there has to be times when we pray and stay in prayer till everything in us dies, all that restlessness of our flesh, all that resistance of our self-will. It dies, all of our preconceived ideas of God and the things of God and what, what prayer is supposed to be has got to die because when we believe that God can't fail and that prayer always works, Biblical prayer always works. When I make up my mind, that's the case. I'm going to tell you right now, I will pray until I, he teaches me to pray. And speaking of that, that's exactly how I learned to pray. I was raised with the Jesus, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah prayers. And they left me so empty. And by the grace of God, he let me grow past that. He led me past that to deeper and more effective praying. And very significantly, he led me beginning in August of 1968. He taught me how to pray in the Spirit. I had never been taught that. I was 22 years old. Had attended Pentecostal church all my life. And not one person that ever preached to me in youth service or Sunday school or pastor ever taught me to pray in the spirit. I, I was just started flight training. I uh, was going to a little home missions church out by the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. And, uh, there was a little home missions church there, and uh, I, I, I had already begun to preach. I knew I was called to preach for years. First acknowledged it when I was 14 publicly, but here I was. I went to the Naval Academy, and now I'm a Naval officer, and I'm in flight training, and I'm going to this little church. The pastor, the church, the pastor of the church had been saved five years. He was in his late 40s. He was, uh, he had had an eighth grade education and uh, he had been the most feared bouncer in the bars of Pensacola. He wasn't but about 5'8", but he, he'd he soon hit you in the forehead with a hammer and look at you. And whatever bar he was a bouncer in, they didn't have any trouble because his reputation went all over Pensacola and he got saved. And he took that same dogged attitude and started a church. And I attended there, and he immediately got me involved. But he taught something I'd never heard my whole life. This man had only been saved five years. He taught me, 
taught the church. He said, I'd never leave the house without speaking in tongues. Well, I'd had the Holy Ghost 10 years, and I spoke in tongues maybe once or twice a year at the most. And he didn't tell me what to do. He just, he just preached that. This is what I do. I believe you're supposed to speak in tongues every day. And I don't leave the house till I pray every day. Well, it took me usually an hour and a half, two hours, three hours sometimes to finally break through in the tongues those few times I did do that each year. And uh, I was raised in the Navy. I'd been to seven different churches in my first 18 years of life, sat under seven different pastors. And so I learned whatever the pastor preached, that's what you did. You believe that. And I didn't question the fact that each one of them had a little different take on stuff. I understood they're all men of God. And if I'm there, God be put me there, I'm going to obey that. So that's what I did. But here's the problem. I couldn't obey the pastor because I didn't know what to do. So I was single at the time, and I started going to church for as many hours as I could spare before ground school on the base. And then during lunch, I'd go across the street to the Naval Chapel, and I, instead of eating lunch, I'd sit there and pray until I had to go back to class. And as soon as class was over, I'd go back to the church, and I'd stay there until I, I, I had to go and rest and study because I was in ground school. I barely passed ground school because I, I was praying. I was praying. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And Lord, this man of God says I'm supposed to speak in tongues and you know I can't do that. Let me tell you something. The Lord taught me how to yield to him and, 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 and give up all of this resistance I had to his spirit. He taught me that. And ever since then, ever since then, I have spent a significant portion of the prayers that I pray each and every day praying in the Spirit by praying in tongues. Just a couple of verses on that, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 5, verses 14 and 15. I've done this even though it was soundly rejected back then by the great majority of my brethren. And it's still reject, being rejected today by far too many people among in the body of Christ. Why? Because you can't pray in the spirit and live by the flesh. You can't do it. You can't do it. Praying in the spirit has saved my, both my life and ministry more times than I can count. When I could pray no other way, the Lord always allowed me to pray in and by the spirit and it would bring me through to victory. Plus, it has been the conduit for praying for things that I personally did not have the faith for seeing them happen because by praying in the Spirit, I was praying with the Lord's own faith in himself. Biblically, he was praying through me. I was just a conduit of his prayer, and that is scripturally proven, among other places, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Paul has been my personal example in his quest, in this quest, for a spiritual life and spiritual lifestyle especially when he said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I'm not competing with anyone about how much I pray except my own flesh and my own human will in regards to how much I pray in the Spirit. But I thank God for the revelation that has characterized and guided my daily life of prayer all of these years. I learned very quickly why it was we fill up what we call our prayer time with Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because we run out of words to say. One young, young man called me and asked for advice on it. He said, I always thought I was cheating if I prayed in tongues. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Why do you think the Lord gave us this supernatural ability? He gave it to us so that he could pray through us. Furthermore, as referenced above in following Paul's teaching in Romans 8, 26, and 27, even when I did not know what to pray for, the Spirit itself prayed through me according to the will of God. By the grace of God, I am following Paul as he followed Christ. Why don't you consider joining me and Paul on this path of life? The Spirit of the Lord has taught me and led me over the years of my salvation experience, and I have progressed in my walk with God. 
As a result, I've grown by the grace of God alone and progressed from praying prayers of obligation and religious expectation by just filling up my prayer time with words, with my mind wandering all over the place. Tell me you don't know what that's about. And then I progressed to having a shared prayer life of relationship with him. But then he finally brought me to the place where I was living his life of prayer as the Lord's conduit of ministry through prayer. I was finally fully on the path of life. I give him all the glory for that. I didn't accomplish that. I didn't produce that. I didn't make that happen. At best, the only thing I did was yield to his guidance, his instruction, and his empowerment. And since God is no respecter of persons, my friend, anyone who wants that and is striving for the same can expect the Father to do the same for them, to them, with them, and through them as he did for me and as he did for Paul. at the risk of sounding sarcastic, which is not my tone of voice or intention at this point, God is very serious about his church becoming and continuing to be a house of prayer and that we would become known first and foremost for our praying, not for our preaching, our singing, our beautiful facilities, our programs, etc. While these things aren't wrong, they are wrong if they're put in a place of priority over prayer. To any degree, his house will and must become a house of prayer first and foremost for him to ever be able to do the things in the earth that he promised he would do. He is not going to do it through our tradition. He is not going to do it through our new, modern, unscriptural methods that have no biblical basis at all, that are all built around personality and performance and intellect and our, the talents and abilities that we're using by the flesh instead of submitting them to God. He is not going to fulfill his promise through that. He's not doing it. The church he blesses is this church. There's never has been and never will be a biblically acceptable to God substitute for a spiritual church that is giving itself continually to prayer as their first priority of faithfulness to God in ministry. That's, that's what he blesses. That's the only church he blesses. Prayer is the only ministry to God and this world that every true child of God can do anywhere at any time in the world, regardless of the circumstances or restrictions under which they are living. They shut down our services. Yeah, they did. They shut down all that we do in a building. Yes, they have. But if you have a prayer life and you have a walk with God, they haven't shut down praying. And while some are so distressed over what we can't do, they're not doing what they can do. And then what does that tell me? And it's telling God that prayers never had the priority in our life that it was supposed to have. Never. Huh. Because prayer can't be stopped by anybody. They have to kill me to stop me from praying because my spirit is in communication with God all the time. Even in my sleep, I'm living in an atmosphere of prayer. I don't have a prayer life. I'm living a life of prayer because I'm his conduit and his spirit that I'm in fellowship with and connection with and that I protect that fellowship and connection with is constantly flowing, whether it's, con where it's, co whether it's conscious in my mind or subconscious. It's constantly flowing. I don't disconnect it to go live my secular fleshly life and come back to it. No, no, no. I don't want any kind of secular fleshly life that I can't do and pray in the spirit consciously or subconsciously while I'm doing it. Why? That's a waste. It's consumed time. It's not invested time. 
Praise God. While the lost must hear the gospel to be saved, any and all preaching that is uh, not founded upon and empowered by prayer is insipid, impotent, and potentially more harmful than helpful. Why? Paul declared that the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The only way to couple the Spirit of God to the Word of God is prayer, and much of it. If we expect people to truly be biblically baptized with both water and the Spirit as a result of our preaching, then the words we speak must first be baptized by and become saturated with the Spirit of the Lord in, by, and through prayer. Prayer. Jesus said in John 6, 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, quickeneth the flesh profiteth, Nothing. Every word that's spoken called preaching that is not prayer and spirit empowered and saturated is impotent. It doesn't accomplish anything that God accepts. Nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing, Jesus said. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How? Because he spent much time alone with the Father. Any results, growth that we have as individual churches or as the collective body of Christ that is greater than the prayers that conceived it, birthed it, nurtured it, and matured it is not from God and never will be. Whatever we can produce in church growth through our plans and programs and efforts that can be done by the flesh, anything that I can do without having to pray to do it is not of God. Anything. Anything that I don't need his empowerment to do is not of God. So I can call it preaching, but he doesn't. I can call it teaching, but he doesn't. I can call it leading praise and worship, but he doesn't. If it's not empowered by and submitted to the Spirit of God in prayer, he doesn't claim it. He doesn't accept it. He never claims as his. He will never claim as his that which his Spirit did not birth and that he has never had and does not have total authority over. He does not share his glory with anyone's flesh. He only claims results that he produced in response to prayer. Now, prayer is the ministry that every child of God, preacher and saint, is called to be a part of first and foremost. Everyone is called to the ministry of prayer. I don't want to hear this hogwash. Well, it, praying is not my gifting. No. Praying is not the gifting of those who are carnal and are minding the, the flesh. No, it's not. But prayer is the first and foremost ministry of every person that's spiritual and minding the things of the Spirit. He, Romans 8, 14, he that is, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And I'm to believe that the Spirit of God is not leading his sons to pray first and foremost. When the Son of God on earth made prayer his first priority, I, I'm to believe that those that God claimed as his Son are not being led by him, by his Spirit to pray. And some that claim to be sons of God aren't following the leading of the Spirit. We're not. Prayer is not our priority. Oh, we may pray, but prayer is not something we work into his schedule. Prayer is our schedule. And he lets us and directs us to add everything else into that schedule as it fits his plan and purpose and will. Otherwise, it's not a him. It's not. No one is called to any ministry. No one has a legitimate biblical calling to any ministry that is not called first to the ministry of prayer. No one. And anyone that says they're called to preach, 
that doesn't have a ministry of prayer that's first and foremost in their lives, it's a lie. Anyone who is participating in any ministry that does not come second in their daily priorities to the ministry of prayer is is disobeying the word of God. This applies to everyone, no matter how known, well-known, or unknown that they are in the church. I don't care who they are. Any ministry that I put in priority over the ministry of prayer is not a ministry that God accepts, and he and it is disobeying God to do so. You know what the problem is? In the church, we have too many religious doers. They got to be doing something for God. And they don't consider prayer, they consider prayer to be a waste of their valuable work time because they don't have a clue what true Christianity and true biblical ministry is all about. They got so much to do. They got so much to do. They don't have time to pray. If you're too busy to pray, you're not busy at all because everything you're doing is worthless. Worthless, worthless. If you're too busy to pray, everything you're doing that you've put in priority over prayer, you might as well ball it all up, throw it in a toilet, and flush the commode because it's just that valuable to the kingdom of God. Some give God lip service in prayer while others just give him lip Doing allows the doer's flesh to both survive and thrive. But to be a prayer, that same flesh must die. The very idea of dying out to their flesh causes the works doer to run in terror from the altar of prayer because their priority is saving their flesh not saving their souls. I am telling you now that this briefing is going to be much longer than the briefings I've done. Both parts one and three will be. I'm in the flow, and I'm going to go till the flow stops, and you decide whether or not you want to hear the rest of this message or not. That's your choice. I have no way of knowing. You're not accountable to me. But if this message came from God, you are accountable to him. So you decide. It is a fearful thing to stand before God's people as representing him to them and claiming that he is speaking through us to them. But when we're doing that while having invested a little to no time hearing from him in prayer for those people. That is terrifying. That makes spiritual charlatans of us and puts our souls in serious jeopardy. Prayerless preachers are fakes. God never uses a prayerless preacher. Oh, you have a gifting that came from God. And you can, uh, Brother Billy Cole taught me, you can operate that gifting by the Spirit of God, by the human spirit, or demonic spirit. And it'll basically work the same. But God only honors that which is done by His Spirit, not by our human spirit, and not by demonic spirit. Because the blind leading the blind and both falling in the ditch is scriptural edict. Following a prayerless preacher puts the souls of people, the sheep of God, in serious jeopardy. And no one is more spiritually blind, nobody, than a prayerless apostolic preacher. Nobody. Nobody. We need to repent for misrepresentation. We need to repent for every time we've got up and preached a sermon and that even if we didn't say, God gave this to me and I'm speaking to you now in the word of God, 
we know that those people understand it is implied that when I stand up there, I am speaking what God has given me to speak to them for them right now, not some canned sermon that I've pulled out of my my file because it sounds good and might impress them. The Word of God repeatedly warns against saying that God spoke to us when he did not because we did not wait on on him in prayer until he did. The only reason we go to the pulpit without a word from God, and I'm using that as our traditional terminology that means that we are preaching or teaching to the people of God as his spokesperson. The only reason we go to that place is because we have not put prayer in our lives to the place of priority that we wait on him until he speaks. Has it never crossed your mind the reason it seems like God's not talking to you is he's using that and hopefully your fear of God that you won't just pray for a few minutes and give him the chance to say something and when he doesn't, I got this, I'll take it from here. Is there any chance that there's a possibility he's using that to keep you praying longer than you would have? Let me tell you something. When you don't do that and you consistently don't do that, you don't have any fear of God. And the Bible says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. That means there's stuff going on in your life that nobody knows about yet. Yet. It's only a matter of time. Over the years, I've traveled to too many places, prayed with too many, and prayed with too many gatherings of believers prayed with too many individuals to ever be easily persuaded to believe our self-deception that we are a praying people according to the biblical definitions, not traditional practices of what prayer is and is not. A few truly do pray. I find them everywhere. They really do pray. Some sincerely try to pray. They really do try to pray. But far too many go through the motions of daily prayer. They get their little list they pray, and God doesn't have a chance to get a word in edgewise. If your prayer doesn't include God talking to you, you haven't prayed yet. If your prayer is not two-way communication, then it's not prayer. Because biblical prayer is supernatural, and it is two-way communication. But here's the group that concerns me the most, because they're polluting our churches. They are the, un, the, the, the large portion of believers, and they're allowed to believe they're believers, who are faithful church service attendees, but they are functionally prayerless. They're functionally prayerless. But the fault of their, them being allowed to pollute our assemblies with their carnality and never be called to account and to repentance, that fault lies with the shepherds who are allowing sleeping sheep to believe that this lack of prayer, lack of spirituality is acceptable to God. It is not. Therefore, the cry from God goes out from the chief shepherd to his under shepherds. Shepherds, where are your sheep at spiritually? Where are they spiritually? Because every shepherd must give, must and will give an account to God. When we allow these sheep, we call sheep, to spiritually sleep so that we can maintain the size of our crowd, we are in serious trouble with God. When we will not preach the word without fear and favor, because we're afraid they're going to get up and leave and take their head count, part of the head count with them, and take their finances with them, and we're more afraid of that than we are afraid of misrepresenting ourselves as the voice of God to that church, we are in serious trouble with God. God, give your shepherds a cry of alarm and warning that will wake up all of your sleeping sheep in Jesus' name, that will call your people to repentance that we might get right with you 
in Jesus' name. But here is the uh, thing I don't want to say, but I don't have any choice but say it. Because ultimately, as a general rule, the sheep, people, pray like their shepherd prays. Too many ministers do not study in order to know the word of God and do not pray in order to know Jesus. When the primary reason that we study and pray is to preach and teach, we do not have a relationship with God. And then we end up trying to preach and teach about a God that we do not know. No pastor can lead people to a place of relationship with God when they have never personally been there themselves and don't personally live there daily themselves. It's impossible. As pastors, we are not called to shepherd the crowd. We are called to shepherd God's sheep. Each sheep counts to God. Those two efforts are not even remotely the same thing. Preaching and coddling and entertaining the crowd is not the same thing as preaching a rhema from God to the people of God every time we open our mouths so that they are called to a place in God where they not only are growing in their grace and the knowledge of their knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but they're be, being equipped and trained and empowered to become a part of the ministry of the body of Christ to this world. When our focus is on the crowd rather than on the sheep, we allow wolves to remain in the midst of the flock that the Holy Ghost is trying to remove. We protect the wolves by refusing to speak the word of God that he gives us. We resist his efforts to remove them because of the impact that they're leaving the flock would have on the size of the crowd and on our finances. Eventually, we retain the wolf. Excuse me. Eventually, to retain the wolf, we will begin to compromise on the things that please God in order to please the wolf no matter how many sheep that could be spiritual children of God, those wolves consume with their example, if not with their words. The pastor that does that and his church will eventually pay a very high price for his spiritual duplicity and resistance to the word and work of the Holy Ghost in his crowd. Jesus' name. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I'm going to go a different direction now. Not rejecting or ignoring all that's been said. <coughs> this is what the Holy Ghost now wants to say. We know that when biblically righteous people pray true biblical prayers, that are prayed in, by, and according to the will of God and are empowered by the Spirit of God, those prayers always work. James chapter 5, verses 16 and 18 says that. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says that. Biblical prayers prayed by righteous people always work. They always work. They cannot fail because God cannot fail. Prayer that pleases him never fails. Prayer prayed in faith according to his will never prays. One of the most enticing and motivating invitations to pray in all of the scripture is when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 and 10, and oh, how I love these verses. And they challenge me to pray. And they challenge me to invest time with God in prayer. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
To understand this invitation from the Holy Ghost is to believe that by investing time in fellowship with the Lord, we can know by revelation from the Spirit of God the secrets of all of God's spiritual provisions that he has planned to give us as we participate with him and his kingdom. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> to understand this invitation that God used Paul to give to us from the Holy Ghost is to believe that by investing time in fellowship with the Lord, much time, we can know by revelation from the Spirit of God the secrets of all of God's spiritual provisions that he has planned to give us as we participate with him and his kingdom. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? Don't you believe that? Don't you want to do that? But here's the condition. We must be willing to submit to the call to prayer being trumpeted by his spirit at this time more than ever in my lifetime if we are to receive these things. If you're not bored with TV and movies and surfing the net by now, God have mercy on your soul. If all of that hadn't left you feeling empty and, and, and wondering what's next, God have mercy on your soul. Well, what are you going to do about that? Why don't you just turn everything off? And not use your iPad except to look up scriptures or to make notes on what God is telling you. And just go to prayer and stay there until you break through past this flesh first and then your own will second. And you break in through into a place of fellowship with God. Maybe you've never either never been or you haven't been to in a long time. And stay there and fellowship with him. First of all, you will find peace in this storm, and he will give you victory by his love flowing in and through you over all fear. And he will fellowship with you and talk with you and give you direction and words of faith, and he will begin to pray with his burden through you for your family, for your friends, for backsliders, for your church for your leaders, for this country, for this world, like you haven't maybe ever or in a long time. Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Also, by and through fellowshipping with him in prayer, as Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus, and that prayer extends to us, we can receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him his kingdom, his plans, his purposes, and the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened and we will know the hope of his calling and we will know what he gets out of this, the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. And we will be given a boost of Holy Ghost confidence that we've never had because he will cause us to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, usward who believe which he wrought in Christ and demonstrated in that greatness of that power in resurrecting Christ from the dead and then, in, then putting him on the throne of the universe in the, in the place of the manifested right hand of God where he rules far above all principality and power and might and dominion and name in this world, the scripture says, not just the world to come. And where we will know in him and him in us that all things are put under his feet and he is the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Don't you want to know that? Don't you want to understand that? Don't you want to believe that? You can study it in the scripture all you want, but it can only fully come by revelation when you, you invest time with him and you receive from him this spirit of wisdom and revelation. And in prayer, according to Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul prayed for the Ephesians and prayed for us, because it's the word of God, it applies to us, we're a part of the church, where he prayed that we would, by the, the riches of the glory of his, his grace, that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man 
so that Christ would be at home in our hearts dwelling there and so that we would be rooted and grounded and unshakable in the love of God. And so that we would receive a revelation of comprehension of the breadth and length and depth and, 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 and height of God's love and the love of God and of God himself and of the kingdom of God and the plan and purpose and will of God in the earth right now. And that we would know in that prayer, by that prayer, that strengthening of the spirit, the, 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 love of God experientially like we've never experienced it before. And experiential love is far more superior than intellectual knowledge of God's love. And all of that will result in us being filled with all the fullness of God. And all of that, the revelation of who we are in God and who God is in us, positions us to now be able to pray the prayers that are manifested by him and him through us to do exceeding abundantly above all we are asking in prayer or even thinking to ask while we're praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, because the power of God is activated in us so that he can be glorified in the church forever, for all generations. When we pray... According to Ephesians 2 and 6, we can sit together with him, past tense, not future tense now, and have been made to sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus as he rules and reigns over the universe. And also, according to Ephesians 3 and 1, he has already blessed us, not will, has already blessed us, those who pray and made us partakers of all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And I can't even possibly begin to understand what that means without fellowshipping with it in prayer, with him in prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ has called us individually and collectively to a life of prayer in him so that we might participate with him in his kingdom work in the earth. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, he taught them how to pray kingdom prayers. And the two situations where he taught in Matthew and the one in Luke, they weren't even the same time and place. And that's why those two prayers are not verbatim the same, either in the Greek or in the English. Why? Because he wasn't te teaching us to repeat those words. He was teaching us the things we need to let him pray through us about. That's why the verbs in those, uh, in those, every verb in there is in the imperative tense of command. We're not commanding God. God is commanding through us. That's why it's called kingdom prayer. And it all starts with our acknowledgement that our Father is in heaven sitting on the throne of the universe and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning over everything. That is the overriding umbrella of all faith for prayer. That we, that our God is already, it, that, and the head of our body is already on the throne far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, every name is the name right now. And that, he is already exercising through the church, the body of Christ, his authority by putting things under the feet if we will put our foot on those things. He commanded us to pray these things. He commanded us to pray them. When you pray, pray ye therefore. That word is in the tense of command. That word pray in both places is in the tense of command. This is not an option. This is something we don't, it's not something we do when we feel like it or don't feel like it. And I know as Pentecostals, we feel very awkward praying that because it makes us feel Catholic. Well, let me tell you something. I don't pray it like they do and just repeating the words. But we are supposed to pray this. This isn't his prayer. This is how he taught us to pray. Are we listening? The offer to be his conduits of his kingdom authority in the earth is unimaginable. Ephesians 3.20. In its scope, potential scope and impact on the earth, if the Lord can just find someone who will consistently pray kingdom prayers. 
on my Bible with the Bishop YouTube channel. There are eight lessons entitled Kingdom Praying. You're welcome to read them. I don't know if you do or not. Don't, I'm not interested in knowing whether you do or not. Then also on Bible with the Bishop channel, there's another series, How to Pray Like the Apostles Prayed. The Kingdom Prayer uh, series has eight lessons that are about an hour each. The How to Pray Like the Apostles has 17 lessons that are about a half hour each. You want to learn how to pray? Allow yourself to be taught how to pray. Prayer can be both taught and caught, but if it's taught, it still needs to be caught. Now, as I'm closing this, one final word of caution in this time of crisis. Hear me now. I beg of you to listen to me. I beg you to listen to me. Survival praying is dangerous. I'm going to prove that scripturally. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you power. That's King James. The Greek is exousia, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I want you to consider this carefully, that the promise of his divine protection is only to those who are on the spiritual offensive, not to those that are on the defensive. Treading on serpents and scorpions, the word tread on is a military term. It's a military term of warfare on the offensive. And he promised that those whose prayers are not defensive but offensive, that he would protect them. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. He promised that. But why are his people hurt? Because we're praying defensive prayer. Oh, God, protect us from the virus. Oh, God, help us. Oh, God, spare us, God. You want to be spared? You want to be protected? Then enter into what his word says to do. <laughs> Survival praying is defensive praying. Not offensive praying. The armor of God and both the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, they only work for those that are on the attack. And what do we think the armor of God is and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit? What do we think that's for? How do we, how do we think we use that every day? We use it in prayer, but not just our now lay me down to sleep, God is great, God is good praying. Not our hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus praying but our spiritually offensive praying, our prayer that is on the offense for the kingdom of God. There is no protection for the spiritual warrior that's in retreat. Your shield is on the wrong side when you're running away. The sword of the spirit doesn't fight what's in front of you but and can't fight what's behind you when you're fleeing in fear for your own survival. The Lord's promise to his church that the gates of hell would not prevail against us is from any perspective of consideration, a promise of victory for those who are on the offensive against or the authority of hell. I heard it preached when I was young. I, it didn't make sense to me then when I didn't even have a clue what it meant. God has promised the gates of hell won't prevail against us, so there's nothing the devil can do to defeat us. He can't destroy us. We're safe. Hogwash. Hogwash. That is so perverted, it's ridiculous. It's twisting the word of God and resting it to our own destruction. It puts the people of God on the defensive and lets them think that if the, that God has promised he's going to defend us in our carnality. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. The only promise that we're going to prevail is if we're on the offensive against the gates. The only promise that the armor of God and the shield of faith, the soul of the spirit is going to work is when in, according to Ephesians chapter 6, where they're talked about in detail, if we're used as it, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, that we're praying all prayer by the spirit on all occasions with perseverance. That's how they're used. 
Some used to call it prevailing prayer, prayers of perseverance, prayers of persistence. It's worse, it, uh, pr prayers of importunity. It's warfare. It's being on the offensive. On the offensive. In order to have the promised land, Israel wasn't waiting for the armies and the peoples of the promised land to come into the wilderness so they could defeat them out of there, out there, and then there wouldn't be anybody left. They could just walk into the promised land. No, it, no, that's not what happened. No. They went on the offensive into the promised land and defeated those nations that God was done with because of the exceeding sinfulness of the lives they lived and defeated them there on their territory. That's why he said, you can't spoil the strong man's house till you first bind the strong man. I beg of you. I beg of you. Those of us that are praying every day, but we're praying prayers of fear, not faith. We're praying prayers of fear. We're, we're praying prayers of fear to survive. We're praying to not lose. While those with faith are praying Prayer, fearless prayers. They're praying for the will of God, the word of God, the name, the authority, the power of God to prevail in the earth. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. If you're praying prayers of survival, prayers of fear and not faith, you, 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 there's no covering. There's no covering for you. There's no protection for you. God is not failing you. You're not obeying the word of God. That's not failing you. It's not failing you. We're failing him by not believing him and his word and doing what he said. It is imperative that the church, the body of Christ and the earth be on their spiritual, at, 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 on their spiritual offensive at this time more than at any time in my entire life. We're not praying for this to be over with. That's in the hands of God. It's in the will of God. We're supposed to be praying on the offensive in the spirit. Kingdom praying that God would somehow deal with us and talk with us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not praying to not lose. We're praying to win. And we're praying everything we're praying and doing is for his glory and his, his kingdom and his kingdom only. We're praying this by his power and not by our power at all. And we're praying all these things for him, his glory, and only for his glory. Jesus' name. And this burden of an apostolic elder, this part two of this three-part urgent message from the Lord. I must confess it is truly impossible to define and describe the privileges in God that the prayer that the prayerlessness are depriving themselves from and of every day. It is truly impossible to define and describe the privileges in God that the prayerless are depriving themselves of every day. Isn't it time we repent of our prayerlessness and pray? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as, as Zechariah prayed in chapter 12, I loose upon you and upon me the spirit of grace, the spirit of prayer, the spirit of supplication, the spirit of intercession, both warfare intercession and travail intercession, that the spirit of God might use us as conduits of his kingdom and his authority, his faith, his power, to do his work in the earth. Anything we're trying to do that we're not trying to do first and foremost by and through prayer, it's not worth doing because it, God's not going to recognize it and accept it. I pray these things upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, but more importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ loves you, but he's not going to accept you or me, our way. He's only going to accept us when we do 
his will, according to his word, his way. I pray and bind the spirit of religious tradition that causes our minds and our hearts and our spirits to be blind to the word of God so that we not only walk as blind, but we lead as the blind. And we all end up in the ditch. In Jesus' name, be free from the spirit of religious tradition. And I command that to be so for the hungry. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.